um, it's, I um, would like to welcome all of you to our most recent career uh, uh, event. Uh, we normally um, would do this in person, but the, view, the good news is, is that uh, in ways it's, it's easier for Randy to participate for not having to, to make the journey back to Penn Law. Uh, we are delighted. Um, this uh, series is a bit of a labor of love for me. Uh, really, uh, I think for those of you who've been to them before, um, I emerged out of my first year of law school knowing no more about what it meant to practice law and what I might want to do with it than I did going in. Because there just weren't opportunities for people in different areas who could to share with you their experiences and to talk about uh, how they got there. And so we started this. And we're also determined to create a real diversity of different perspectives of people, uh, of, of careers and career paths. And to me, uh, Randy Tritel epitomizes this in every way you can possibly imagine. Uh, Randy is a 1977 graduate of the law school uh, who then went into private practice at Wild Gotcha where he became a partner, but shortly thereafter entered the Federal Trade Commission, entered government service, uh, serving in a variety of roles, assistant to the director of Bureau of, of Consumer Protection, attorney advisor to Commissioner Terry Calvani, another former Vanderbilt faculty member actually, uh, and executive assistant to the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission before uh, landing in his current role, which is uh, he's the uh, director of the Federal Trade Commission's Office of International Affairs, where he coordinates all of their policies and engagements internationally and involvement in cases. And so um, uh, we're delighted to have Randy here to share with us the perspective. As Caroline said earlier, this is being recorded. And as, because it's a nice uh, a group, what I would like before Randy, before I hand it over to you, uh, I would like each of the students to introduce themselves briefly and uh, just so they know he has an idea of uh, the people he's talking to and uh, the interests of what brought you here. And I do wanna make one small footnote. You left, you entered the FTC right out of law school. Right, they went to private. And public sector, private sector, public. I'll, I'll uh, spin it out, yeah, okay, yeah, great. yeah. So let's um, just, I've got there in a particular order on my screen, Sanjay would, you, Sanjay, would you please introduce yourself? Um, hi, I'm uh, Sanjay Jolly, I'm a 3L, um, former uh, student of uh, and professor of internet law class. I'm also a PhD candidate at the Annenberg School for Communication. Um, and uh, yeah, I have interest in, in communications law and trade law, so I'm, I'm very excited to hear from you today. Uh, Sarah Ribley. Thank you, Sandy. You're still on mute, Sarah. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think I'd be used to that by now. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a 3L. Um, I am a former DOJ antitrust paralegal, and I also spent my summer this past summer at the FTC. I'm not sure where I'll be next year, but possibly back at antitrust. Well, where in the FTC were you? I was in Mergers One. I had an awesome time there. They are cool. Thank you, Sarah. Kali K. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for hosting this. Um, I'm a prospective applicant, actually. So I came about this event um, via the Center for Technology Innovation and Competition. Um, I have a master's in, in fine art and work with art at the intersection of technology. So um, just tuning in tonight. Thanks. Wonderful to have you. Thanks. Good to have you. Tonya Oglesby. Hi, thanks for having me. I am also a prospective student. I'm interested in the intersection of technology, technology, policy, and law. I'm actually um, driving in my car right now, so forgive me. <laughs> but thank you for um, having this forum. Randy, you're packing them in. Katya <laughs> Johns. I, I, oh, oh okay. Um, hi, Randy. Uh, my name is Katya. I'm a JD MBA student um, in my 1L year currently and um, I'm interested in antitrust issues um, as well as uh, possibly working at the FTC uh, postgrad. Thank you, Katya. And Grace. Hi. I'm uh, actually a master in law student, and I found out about this event through the, uh, the master in law email that goes out every week, and I was interested to know more about it. Well, thank you, Grace. So I think you that's a rough idea, Randy. Now, you have one of the coolest jobs I know of in the government. Um, did you imagine when you were a student sitting where these people are now that you would ever end up in the kind of position you are in now? Uh, but let me assure you, I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So how did it happen? All right. Well, look, um, th thanks for having me, uh, Christopher. And it's, uh, you've got a, a, just a terrific group here. And uh, I'm going to take issue with one thing you said, which is that this saved me a trip to, to Philadelphia as if this were that were an advantage. I'd love to have been with you uh, in person. I'd love to have come to Philly. I used to do some on-campus recruiting, and I always enjoyed that, even though, as I told Carolyn, I would be in that recruiting center with uh, surrounded by law firms whose uh, sign-up sheets were, were full with 10 people on the waiting list. Uh, and, and I would have a person about every three hours who was interested in coming to the government. <laughs> but I'm glad we have some people who, who are interested uh, to today, and I'm, I'm happy to share my experience. Uh, and I want to make this as worthwhile as possible. So um, but let me suggest what, what I could do, Christopher and, and Carol, but you, you guys tell me, uh, I, I, I can just walk you very quickly through my career path and then uh, take questions, whether they are on, you know, moving along the career path or, or what I did substantively in any, in any of these um, capacities, because I see some people are interested actually in the substantive area. So I'm happy to take that in any of those directions. Sounds wonderful. All right, so so here's so you've already outed me how, how ancient I am, and, and when, I, <laughs> when I graduated, yet we used to when I when I was a student, we'd see you know on, on reunion weekend we'd see the, the you know the, the forty year class go through the courtyard, and we say, oh god, that's going to be us one day, and then now that's me. So, uh, um, but I, I came to law school having having no idea what uh, I wanted to do with my degree. I came for you know, partly for the wrong reasons because back then. Uh, if you uh, didn't know what you wanted to do af after college, except some vague desire to make the world better or something, you'd, you'd go to law school. Uh, and and uh, I, I had a terrific experience in education at Penn. It's really served me well. We can go into that. But um, I didn't have much more idea, like you were saying, Christopher, when I came out uh, of what I wanted to do, except I had a vague interest in public policy. In fact, I had been accepted to a joint program with the yeah, Fell Center. The problem is they sent me a calculus exam over the summer, and I thought, this is not what I really had in mind. It turned out to be a very modeling heavy uh, program. So I applied also to the Wharton Public Policy, Public Administration program. And I was going to do that as a joint degree. And then when I talked to the faculty there, I'm, I'm sure it's better now, but at the time they said it's not worth spending an extra year to do that. You can do that with a pen. You can do the kind of stuff you want to do with a pen law degree. Actually, that turned out to be true. So I, I was interested in going to Washington and doing something with a vague, some, some opportunity to go into policy areas. So I wound up at the Federal Trade Commission uh, after law school, which was doing a lot of interesting things uh, in the antitrust and consumer protection areas. And I, I joined the Consumer Protection Bureau as a staff attorney. And uh, the w one thing I'll say about that right now is that I, I quickly got one of the benefits that's often touted as um, being true of, of some, at least some government service as opposed to uh, private sector, which is responsibility very early on. And um, that helped me grow as, as a lawyer. And I was in a division that did compliance with FTC orders. And then I thought I might want to do some litigating. I took one of these uh, litigation classes and moved within the FTC. Um, and, and shortly thereafter, I got my first lucky break, which is when New management came into the FTC in, in 1981. Uh, one of the new officials, uh, Christopher, I'm sure you have come across Tim Uris. Uh, Tim, Tim was a young Windsor kind from the law and economics movement who came in then. And I got an opportunity to make a small presentation to him and he hired me on his personal staff. So I moved from uh, being a regular staff attorney to being um, an, an assistant to uh, a political official and, and had a chance to really learn a lot uh, in that case about the law and economics movement, which was which was brand new and and has proven very Im important. Um, a couple of years into and and by the way, I thought I'd come to the FTC for two years and then uh, the, the typical two years of government service and then maybe go into private practice and come back. But I got this other opportunity and then I got another one, another lucky break, which is a new commissioner joined the FTC and I was asked to go help him. Uh, get on his feet, especially in the consumer protection area. And that was Terry Calvani, who uh, Christopher mentioned was, uh, had come from the Vanderbilt faculty and, and was a brilliant antitrust lawyer. And they sent me to his office to uh, help him on consumer protection issues for a while. And what was supposed to be 
a three-month stint uh, turned out to be a three-year great experience. Um, because uh, I, first of all, I told, I told my boss, uh, I'll be happy to help you with consumer protection, but while I'm in the neighborhood, I'd, I'd like to learn some antitrust. And he gave me that opportunity. And then, as luck would have it again, I, when the then chairman of the FTC left, uh, they made my boss the acting chairman of the FTC, and he made me his, what they now call, chief of staff. So still at a pretty young age, I got a whole nother set of experiences, which were not strictly legal. Uh, it, it, got, it entailed dealing with issues of budget and personnel and, and uh, running the agency. Um, so it was a heady experience. I was, I was very fortunate to have that, but all things must end. And uh, when the next chairman came on, it had been eight years at the FTC, and I thought I, I really better make my move into the private sector if I'm ever going to do that. And it was at a time when uh, the fields I was most confident in uh, were pretty dead in the, in the mid 80s, and there weren't many opportunities. So what opportunities I had actually came out of um, contacts that my my bosses who had become mentors uh, had helped create for me. And I'd gotten involved in the American Bar Association's section of antitrust law, uh, through, which is a terrific networking uh, opportunity. And the people I got to meet there were the people to whom I sent my resume and were willing to talk to me. And, and the one that materialized um, out of that was uh, an associate position at Weil Gottschall and Mangies in, uh, in, in New York. And there I was able to do antitrust, consumer protection. And I, I said, I'd also be interested in doing something else while I'm here. How about international trade? And they were willing to, to accommodate that. So again, I was able to expand my, uh, my horizons. And after some time at, at Weil Gottschall, just as at the time when was, was I going to stay, leave, be counsel, be partner, or what? I got my next lucky break, which was somebody walked into my office and asked me if I'd be interested in opening an office, and I didn't know what the rest of the sentence was going to be, and they said, in Brussels, which was interesting because most of my work had been with the Far East, but it turns out that having done work on regulatory areas and antitrust and trade, it's just what they do in Brussels, and being at the right time in my career, being out of school now eight, nine years, no, no, it was longer than, uh, 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 but not having a fully developed practice to leave behind, it was good timing for everybody. So I jumped on that. I went to Brussels, opened the office, and and spent wound up it was supposed to be a two year stint, uh, spending six years in in Brussels and and building the, the office. And this was a huge growth experience. For one thing, uh, although I was with a huge international firm, I was part solo practitioner. Um, I had to hire a secretary. I had to buy a desk uh, and, and, and all the practical things uh, that I had never thought about in, uh, in my law firm. I, I asked my secretary to uh, oh, email then to send a letter and she asked where, I, where she can get a stamp. And I had no 24 hour mail room to, uh, to which to refer her. Um, and, but in addition, although I was sent there for some expertise in some substantive areas, uh, because I was the firm's only person at the time in Western Europe, I got all kinds of bizarre inquiries into fields I knew nothing about. They said, well, our, our client wants to do a, a global merger and, and we need to know the labor law situation in, in Spain, Norway, and Greece. And so you have to you know, adjust on your feet and figure out how to get advice and hire local counsel and deal with different cultures. So this was my next growth experience. And then I also had an opportunity to build the office and found a couple of people in telecoms, which was big then to add and wound up building an office of, of 15 lawyers. Uh, and it was great, but I didn't want to, I, I had a family by then uh, and I didn't want to uh, live my wife and bring up my kids in, in Belgium. So it was time to think about moving back. So I was talking to the firm and I was thinking about other opportunities and along comes my next good break, which was, a call from the Federal Trade Commission saying they're looking for somebody to head international. And this was perfect because I love Washington, I love the FTC, I wanted to stay in international. And uh, I, that's what I did. So I, I moved back, this was now 1998, but this was heading the, the um, international antitrust operation in the FTC's Bureau of Competition. 
And we had a small office of, of four people, but inter, an international antitrust was growing by leaps and bounds. So an opportunity to, to help build that office. And the next thing you know, uh, a, a future chairman, uh, Christopher, this was Debbie Majoris, said, uh, you know, we do international antitrust, but we also do international work and consumer protection on cross-border fraud. We're starting to do it on privacy. So why don't we just create one international office that unifies it? And they, they um, created that office and, and I applied and was able to become the, uh, the head of what's now the Office of International Affairs in 2007. And it just amazingly brought back everything uh, from, my, from my career. Uh, the policy work, the consumer work, the antitrust work, the international work. And we were able to build an office of 25 people that is at the center of, of the FTCs and, and the US government's uh, international work, uh, along with DOJ and antitrust in, in these areas. So I've, I've been just extremely fortunate through absolutely no planning foresight of, of, of my own, um, a, lot, a lot of good breaks. Um, but there are some lessons in there somewhere and I'll be happy to try to share whatever they, they, they may be. So I'm gonna stop there probably too long and, and I will be delighted as I mentioned to answer questions about anything, including anything I actually did in these jobs or do now or uh, how the career path uh, manifested itself. So before we open up to questions, I usually ask the speaker to say, Tell us one cool thing or cutting edge thing or that's going on in your job right now. Well, look, we're, we're dealing, Christopher, as you well know, with uh, um, seismic currents in, uh, particularly in the, in the antitrust world. Um, as I say, I, I learned this law and economic stuff, which took over the field of antitrust and to some extent uh, consumers as, as well. And what had been a contentious battle between a populist view of the world and an economically based view it was won by the economically based and consumer welfare people. And that was a consensus for 30 years. That consensus is under serious challenge right now uh, in the US and, and internationally. And uh, my, my office is in the cross currents of this, watching what's happening in, in the US, including on the Hill um, and, and moving even more quickly in, in various capitals uh, abroad. We've been promoting an idea of international convergence around a certain agreed set of, of principles uh, that I don't know if uh, they're agreed anymore. So um, that, that's, that's one thing that uh, is, is challenging that we're dealing with. And I'll just, I'm going to, I'm going to, that's in sort of two layers. One is how should for example, traditional antitrust law be changed if at all to deal with the digital economy and so forth. But Another layer of that is, should we just be thinking about competition when we do antitrust cases, uh, or should we think about employment and sustainability and industrial policy and development? So it's a whole nother layer of thinking about things and it's challenging and interesting. So that's, that's on my plate. Sounds, sounds fascinating. Well, at this point, we'll open up the floor to anyone. Um, I should introduce, we have been joined by another student. David Waits is a 1L student who did his undergraduate work at Vanderbilt. Great. So David, just so you know, we were chatting before, I used to teach her, Randy son is a, a 1L law student as well there, so. Anyway, um, if we're a nice enough small group. If you want, just um, either just unmute, wave your hand, ask a question um, about where uh, anything that comes to mind. Sanjay. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, you know, doing, you know, working international trade, but doing it from the position of being at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, you know, where you have sort of specific duties to um, uh, protecting markets and protecting consumers, like how that interacts in your job with um, national security prerogatives and how those things get negotiated um, on, on a very general level, but also like in the nitty gritty in terms of the, the kinds of um, conversations and coordination you have to have with, you know, with folks that you know, state and um, and defense and treasury. That that is a terrific question, Sanjay. I'll do my I'll do my best with it. First, most or all of you probably already know this, but for avoidance of doubt, uh, although we're called the Federal Trade Commission, it's trade in the domestic commerce sense. The 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 uh, mandate of the FTC is to co-enforce the antitrust laws with the Department of Justice. 
uh, to we're the leading consumer protection law enforcer and, and we do work in the data privacy area. Trade qua international trade is done in the USTR, Department of Commerce and elsewhere. However, there, there is an, an overlap uh, as, as your question um, in, in, intimates. Um, and so I'll mention a couple of things. One is uh, narrow on the narrower side, we, we participate with the other agencies in negotiating these trade agreements, these free trade agreements, um, the uh, US, whether the US-Korea trade agreement or one we might do with Britain or, or, or Europe now and NAFTA and its successor and, and so forth. Those agreements almost always now have a, a competition chapter and the FTC along with the DOJ generally leads the negotiation of, of those uh, of those chapters, but they're under the supervision, under, under the auspices of USTR, which co uh, US Trade Representative's Office, which is in the White House, which coordinates all of the chapters, uh, understandably, for, uh, for the government and the Department of Commerce uh, participates, the Department of State, although rarely on substance, and, and, the, and Treasury, as you, as you also indicate. But we get a lot of deference to our substantive expertise in, in, in negotiating those kinds of um, Ch chapters. Um, there are some um, areas where we overlap, where there are um, there's a, a strong need for, for coordination uh, on, on how we handle them. Well, I'll give you a, a, an, an example. Uh, some people say that some countries, you can probably think of who this might refer to, um, take their, let's say, antitrust law, and instead of using it to promote their consumers and consumer welfare, uh, misuse it to distort trade and, and advance their own national champions. And this gets US companies upset, and they go, understandably, to us and say, what's going on here? And we say, we'll talk to our friends in the other antitrust agency. But they also go to other parts of the US government uh, even to the White House and, and Congress, and so you got to do something about that. And by do something, uh, it's everything from yell at them to make them sign stuff that say they won't do it anymore to consider sanctioning them in, in some way. And so this in, implicates this intersection of trade and competition policy, which is delicate because um, competition is, we think of as being based on economics, consumer welfare, not nationality not politics, but trade is inherently producer welfare driven, political. Um, so there's a delicate uh, dance here in how to, um, how to keep our area free of, of uh, undue political influence uh, while the United States government can try to accomplish its own, um, its own trade ob objectives. Uh, and another place it comes up, I guess, is in the uh, data privacy area, which can be contentious. You may have seen some of the issues with, with Europe and, and their general dire uh, directive um, on, on privacy, the GDPR, um, which uh, is quite restrictive. And, uh, and now the, the uh, accord that was struck between the US and the EU, uh, so-called privacy shield has been struck down by the European court. So we work, uh, and then this is an area that's held uh, jointly by, let me shut this off, by um, the, the, the FTC has a role in bringing cases for, against companies that, that misrepresent their privacy promises, but there's also a big role for the Department of Commerce on, on privacy policy. So we, uh, we work very closely with them and, and the State Department in dealing with, say, Europe on GDPR, and, and other cross-border uh, data privacy transfer um, issues. So I wanna emphasize one little, one aspect of what Randy said that kind of might've gotten lost, which is, um, this is called, there's a, a concept in international law called regime shifting, which is the US government, if it's pursuing these antitrust negotiations, he talked about the US-Korea agreement, that's bilateralism. He talked about NAFTA, that's regionalism. And there's also multilateralism at the large organizations at the International Competition Network. And it's a, it's a strategic choice how and where you choose to engage other countries in terms of this negotiation. How do you think, I mean, how does this, what office does your play, what role does your office play in directing that? And how do you think about this? 
Our traditional, that's a great question, Christopher. Our, our traditional way was to prefer that these be that these issues be dealt with as a technocratic manner in, in antitrust specific contexts. Um, when I when I came back to the FTC in 1998, uh, for, for then and for the ensuing five, six years, uh, there, there were discussions underway in the World Trade Organization um, based on European proposals to uh, impose competition disciplines as part of the WTO. And in the US, we thought that wasn't a good idea we th because for the reasons, kind of reasons I mentioned that it would politicize the, and, and uh, so, so um, for various reasons that, that never happened and there are no multilateral rules on, on competition uh, in, in a binding way. And by the way, all the competition provisions in the trade agreements are non-binding. Um, and so we much prefer to deal with these things uh, in organizations like, as you mentioned, the ICN, the International Competition Network, uh, where we get together with all our colleagues from the world and develop consensus best practices. And we use a kind of uh, peer pressure to encourage their adoption, but they are non-binding. Uh, un unlike in a trade agreement, you can't say, well, you're not doing what you said you're gonna do, so we're gonna you know, put tariffs on your beef or wine. So we, that's you know, antithetical to the goals of antitrust. And again, the problem that we see with mixing up trade and competition goals. So our druthers would be to keep these in, in um, an antitrust space, but they have migrated into these trade agreements. Again, so far in a non-binding way, but it, it, it creeps up there. So in the, in the Korea agreement, there are provisions saying that the uh, Korean authorities have to um, implement various due process mechanisms. And you may have seen a year or so ago, US Trade Re Representative's Office initiated a consultation under the non-binding provisions, uh, claiming that Korea was not honoring those. So th these are you know, getting more teeth in them. Um, the, the US Chamber put out a report advocating you know, strong, even stronger measures in, in trade agreements. So. That's, uh, that's the balance we deal with. But I would say most antitrust people would probably prefer to keep antitrust sort of pure from politicized uh, trade context. Well, especially because the WTO has essentially become um, paralyzed by the US's refusal to uh, nominate someone for the appellate body. And that's that, another problem. <laughs> but at the international level, they can only be, complaints can only be initiated by state. So it's inherently political. And so by tying yourself to that trade rubric, you really put yourself in a different world than we traditionally have in antitrust. Right, right. Well, as, as you know, there are some agreements with so-called investor state dispute settlement where a company can, but uh, no. Absolutely. Uh, Katya, you have a question. Yeah, um, I was more interested in your take on the domestic interplay with uh, Congress and sort of the House Judiciary Committee, um, you know, particularly your views uh, watching the NHS hearings um, over the summer. I know some of us young ones were watching consternation at, you know, some House representatives' just sheer ignorance of um, these, uh, the revenue models of these digital marketplaces. Um, and so I was curious as to your thoughts on whether you think that was the right venue uh, for uh, this hearing. Um, I'm not so sure on the uh, legislative uh, uh, intricacies here. Um, and also, and if so, just how can we, how can the representatives be better equipped to deal with these issues? Okay, um, so this harkens to what I mentioned before about this controversy that has gotten more, more and more uh, attention about whether there ought to be a fundamental rethinking of um, antitrust law and policy. And, and on one hand, when, when the agencies are, are criticized for, for not using the, their current laws in a more expansive way, uh, you know, one, one thing we say, which is true, is where we can only do what the courts allow, and the courts have interpreted the antitrust laws in a certain way. So 
if, if somebody thinks that's not right and should be changed, then the right venue is to go to Congress and change the law. And we, you know, we do what we're told. Um, so uh, to me personally, and by the way, anything I say is my own personal view, not the view of the FTC, any commissioner, um, but it, it's, uh, it's healthy to vet these issues uh, in, in, uh, in hearings like, like those that have been, been, been held uh, to get the different views on, on, on the table. Um, now, in terms of you know, where, where we should go from, from here, um, look, I'll just say it for what it's worth. I mean, my personal, there's, a, there's, a, there's some that say we need radical overhaul of the antitrust laws. I'm not one of those people. The, um, the Sherman Act was passed in 1890. It's a very, very broad statute that, that prohibits restraints of, of trade and the Clayton Act similarly to uh, prohibit mergers that tend to lessen competition or create a monopoly. In my view, those laws have proven extremely adaptable and, and flexible. I think every generation, somebody says, well, there's new this, new that, new technology. You know, 15 years or 20 years ago, it was B2B, what should we do? Um, <clears throat> And uh, in, in my view, the, the, the laws we have are, are sufficiently adaptable. The tools we have are sufficiently adaptable. We have brilliant economists who can help us think through the effects of, of these uh, practices and, and to um, challenge them if we think they're, they're in a competitive. So I, personally, I don't support a need for, for overhaul of, of the laws and, and particularly to the extent that, that people suggest in importing into the antitrust laws other uh, objectives beyond um, economically based con consumer welfare. Let me tell you, it is hard enough in evaluating a proposed merger, which is a predictive exercise, or, or even um, conduct by an allegedly dominant firm to determine whether that's now or going to be anti-competitive. We spent years investigating these things, holding hearings, looking at evidence, running economic models uh, to determine whether it'll be a net benefit or, or detriment to, to uh, consumer welfare. If one were to throw in there, well, it may or may not be good for consumer welfare, but on the other hand, it may cost 500 jobs from, from this factory, or it may impede an environmental goal or, or help it. How the federal trade commissioners or assistant attorney general for antitrust is supposed to weigh that on top of the already quite challenging job of competitive effects, I don't think it's the right place for it. So I can see tweaking the antitrust laws within the current sort of box, um, but I'd, I'd hate to personally, I'd hate to see it go beyond that. Um, if you're interested, Katya, the thing I should invite you to do is we're doing a program on December 2nd on uh, recent developments in antitrust law and the House committee report is the first thing we'll talk about, literally, because it is sort of um, you know, what we're talking. But I want to focus more on your job, Randy. So that's your opinion about domestic, but let's take it into your role as head of the international office. So now you're representing and deal, dealing with other countries and you know, their uh, national competition authorities. And they are all looking at, we have a, a set of laws or judicially enforced, we have this whole congressional thing going on. What does that do to your job and how you talk about what we're doing here? And how, I mean, it's got to put an interesting cross current into what you have to do. Well, we have to be careful. Uh, we, uh, it, 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 uh, it requires us to be, to be cautious as you, uh, as you imply, Christopher. Um, but look, it's, it's at the moment, that's not quite the same in the other countries. They're, they're further, Along, I mean, nothing's really happened yet. There's a revolutionary German bill that's probably going to become law. There's uh, there are some very far-reaching proposals from from Brussels to do this so-called new competition tool that will enable them to uh, uh, essentially to restructure industries based on hearings without proving any law violation by a company. Uh, and there are um, so-called ex-ante regulatory proposals that will probably come to fruition in, in the UK and, and elsewhere. So th this is all, um, you know, gurgling in, in all of these places, including in the US. And, you know, given the political composition, I think it's actually more likely to take place um, abroad. Um, but but having, having said that, it's not, it's, as you know, it's not a, a clear partisan issue in, in the US 
either, although the House Judiciary Report was signed on to only by the committee Democrats. Um, there, there are um, Republicans, uh, leading Republicans who also are, are very critical of the tech companies and of current antitrust uh, in enforcement who would like to see reform. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but but just given that, given the un the uncertainty and and you know we just we uh, we can say what we can do now, but um, I don't know. We have to be careful, hedge our bets against the future. I guess it's an interesting position to be in. Uh, yeah. And having said that, uh, you know, well, let me just emphasize that. Although I mentioned this interesting policy aspect of, of my job, I mean, a lot of the day, the job is just day to day workman like stuff. Um, we are a resource. We're not a litigating shop, so uh, we have, uh, uh, as many of you know, we have a Bureau of Competition and a Bureau of Consumer Protection that have a few hundred lawyers each and do all the investigating and litigating. Um, we are a resource for them in the sense that they come to us if they would like to know uh, if, if they can uh, assert you know, the kind of things you learn in civil procedure, you know, personal jurisdiction over X or take a deposition in, in another country. Uh, and another thing we do is arrange the cooperation between our agency and other agencies that might be evaluating the same merger or looking at the same conduct, uh, looking at the extent to which we can share documents and information, trying to arrive at the same result. Um, so uh, a lot of, for a lot of it, we put the whole um, debate behind us and we're just focused on um, you know, helping implement the current day-to-day -day enforcement agenda of, of the agency. And a lot of it you do is helping train international agencies because that, that's a right that that that's a a smallish but but we consider very important part of our of our work um this originated uh after the berlin wall fell uh in the early 1990s the u.s went into central and eastern europe to help uh, those countries coming out from the yoke of communism and and transitioning to market economies and having no idea how to do that so we sent uh, teams of advisors in, in many areas, uh, including antitrust. And it was run by the US Agency for International Development, US uh, AID. Uh, and we sent resident, we sent experts from the FTC and DOJ uh, to help them establish agencies and help them get on their feet and help them uh, start bringing cases. Uh, and and um, that program has expanded to help newer agencies around the world. Uh, at the time, there were only 15, 20 antitrust agencies in the world. Now there are over 130. And we've helped an awful lot of them. We've sent people on short-term missions and we've sent a lot of people uh, as resident advisors. They would move to, to Warsaw, to uh, Johannesburg, to uh, Hanoi. And they would spend three, six months and more at a time um, living and working in the agency uh, and, and we, we have, well, until the pandemic, we had advisors in Ukraine helping with law reform. Um, so yes, that's, that's uh, an important part of uh, our, our work that we're very proud of. And what they often want to know is not just this policy stuff, but how do you bring a case? You know, how do you prove it? You know, what are the middle mechanics? That's exactly right. That's, that, that's what we're doing there. That's why we want to be on the ground. That's why we want to be not 5,000 miles away, but down the hall when they're looking at documents and trying to scratch, scratching their head and saying, well, what does this do to my market definition? And our advisor's there and they can, they can sit with them and, and work problems through in real time. Sarah. Yeah, my question is very much a follow-up <coughs> to that point. Um, less intellectual than my colleagues, but um, more inspired by my own wanderlust, which has reached pathological point uh, over the past 10 months. I'm wondering just how much um, travel is involved in the work that your office does and whether there are kind of perennial destinations or whether it becomes, you know, a placement in um, a country who's working on standing up a competition or consumer protection agency, just what that looks like um, sort of on the more day-to-day -day level. And sure. in COVID times. Uh, <laughs> right. So this is all, you know, pre-pandemic pre right. and post, we hope post-pandemic. Although I'll come to that. It's not going to be quite the same, but everybody in our office does a lot of travel. That's part of the deal. Uh, so that, 
it varies depending upon what portfolios people have. Uh, some people do this technical assistance work, and uh, although we also draw on people elsewhere in the agency, so Sarah, we've had people from you know Mergers One uh, go uh, spend a week in uh, you know Croatia or Korea teaching uh, um, how to draft merger guidelines, uh, but we and but also people who spend six months uh, in in an agency. Uh, more common though is uh, traveling for meetings and conferences around the world. Um, so some of those are, are ad hoc and can, and can be anywhere, but you ask which are, are, are recurring and, and there are those as well. So for example, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD in Paris, uh, is one of our uh, regular um, venues. They hold um, two meetings a year for a week at a time on competition and uh, we, we spend the, we have a few people usually headed by a commissioner or a chairman or a commissioner and then people from my office, sometimes an expert or two from another part of the agency will go over there and participate uh, in, in sessions um, um, called roundtables on, on discrete issues. We, uh, we would submit a paper on the US position on uh, so-called killer acquisitions, acquis acquisition of nascent competitors, which is the hot topic now. So we would do a paper We'd send somebody over to present the U.S. view and engage in, in discussion, and there'd be a whole series of meetings like that over the course of, of the week. Um, we talked about the International Competition Network, which is essentially a virtual network, but we have one uh, in-person big meeting a year, and that's a movable feast. It's been in different places all over the world. We'd send a bunch of people to that, and then they have workshops uh, during the course of the year. It might be on um, assessment of uh, of a, of a dominant position uh, in, in Japan, and it might be on you know, a totally different topic in, in Cairo. So we were always sending people to conferences of, uh, of that nature. Same on the consumer protection side where we're dealing with uh, shutting down cross-border fraud. We work closely with law enforcement around the world. We work, for example, hand in hand with authorities, including criminal authorities in India to shut down call center frauds and we had somebody who was back and forth constantly to uh, India to do that. Um, we participate in the uh, in ICANN, the uh, the international uh, the assigned the, 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 domain, the domain names uh, people. Uh, uh, and, and there's an important consumer protection component to that to ensure uh, to try to minimize the use of, uh, of, of internet domains for fraudulent purposes. And we have people go to these ICANN conferences um, and, uh, and, and certainly on data privacy, um, there, there are uh, meetings and conferences around the world. So a lot, of, a lot of conference type stuff. And then bilateral meetings, we meet, we try to meet every year with our colleagues from the Japanese Fair Trade Commission, uh, with the European Commission, some of our major partners. We have a, a whole network of cooperation agreements that provide for periodic meetings. We, we try to meet once a year with the uh, Chinese antitrust authorities. So a lot, a lot of travel. So there will be people who are on the road for uh, one to three weeks a month um, for, for a lot of the year. And then people who travel uh, you know, a good bit less than that. So, but um, people get, get to go to some nice places, some not so nice places. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, if you like that kind of thing, it's a great perk of the, of the work. Well, Brandy, you're also being too modest. It's the United States hosted the International Competition Network this year. And your organization, your office was one of the, org the lead organizers for that. It was supposed to be in person, Los Angeles, and needless to say, it wasn't. But <laughs> it was a it was a great honor, and I'd, I'm sure a great opportunity, and a lot of work for your office to get involved in. It was a massive amount of work. So thanks for mentioning that, Christopher. Yes, uh, although we held back from hosting the conference, this was our our big year, uh, and we had planned an in person fest at. Uh, in, in LA for May and we postponed it to September and then we had to take the whole thing virtual and yeah a lot of people whom you know Christopher uh, worked their butts off uh, triply to make this all happen but we were very fortunate to be able to pull it off and look one of the benefits was that uh, that was going to be a conference for 600 people in person and we wound up on day one I think when you were we were very honored to have you uh, speak uh, as one of our keynotes Christopher 
but we had over 2,500 unique viewers on, on day one of the conference, and we never could have accomplished that in, uh, in a conference center. So, and as with the travel, and I forgot to come back to that, Sarah, but, but um, we're gonna continue, we're gonna pick up traveling one day, but it, like everything else post pandemic, it, it will never be the same. We've learned a lot about how to reach big audiences and, and how much we can do without getting on a plane. And it's gonna be a hybrid from, from here on in. Will be interesting. Uh, Griffin, other before you, he's such a road warrior, <laughs> Professor. You is well. Uh, I got nothing on Randy. Oh, is that right? Well, uh, I, it's all relative, Christopher. You know, you know, people like like Bill Kavasik and Fred Jenny. So I've got nothing to That's compare true. to them. <laughs> so Bill teaches in the UK like a couple weeks out of every month, and so it's pretty um, spectacular. Mm. Anyway, um, before, any other questions for Randy or otherwise? Sanjay? And then, um, this is related to um, my first question. Um, so during the uh, FTC Qualcomm litigation, um, and then also during uh, the um, some of the big social media hearings over the last couple of years around antitrust, um, or the platform uh, hearings, um, the argument has come like the. Sometimes it's called the um, national champion argument um, around you know um, uh, you know you know you've got to be really careful about regulating these platforms because we're not just talking about U.S. domestic markets. We're also talking about uh, great powers competition and uh, you know folks in China. You know the Chinese regulators are not um, uh, you know taking actions that that. Uh, would you know threaten to diminish the size of their um, of their biggest and best companies? Um, is that uh, an argument that folks at the FTC or antitrust regulators um, uh, are grappling with? And, and what is that tension between you know the um, you know the sort of uh, ensuring the integrity of domestic markets and uh, and also you know um, the kind of preeminence of uh, U.S. corporations, like I mean, do those, you know, do those clash? And uh, you know, is there a way of resolving that? And how do you, uh, how do you tend to deal with those issues? Do you do yeah, that's, that's not only a great question; it's a tough question, and I appreciate it. And 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 by the way, your your question reminded me that I, I, I so I'm going to take just a minute first to address a part of your first question that I think I never answered. You mentioned the intersection not only with international trade but with national security before, and um, let me be clear on that. That is and it's going to relate to this answer too, but that is essentially separate, totally separate function in the government from, from what we do. So an, an example would be a, a merger in, in which a, uh, a Chinese company wants to buy an American company. They would file under the Hartscott Rodino Act with the, with the antitrust agencies, and we would look at, is this any competitive or not? It may also be subject to review on national security grounds by the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., the CFIUS Committee, which is run by, by Treasury, which would look at the national security concerns. And, and that, that, that is a totally separate process. The FTC does not sit on that board. Uh, justice may have a role, but it's not the antitrust division that, that does. Um, so so those, are in, those are in different silos. Now, having said that, um, <laughs> National security concerns can pop up in, in, in our cases uh, in, in a couple of ways. Um, one example, this happens rarely, but it's, it happens and we've said so publicly, if there's a merger in the defense industry and uh, the defense department is the only buyer, the only customer, uh, and they tell us this is a good thing for for national security, uh, even though it's a monopoly or it doesn't look like something we would normally give a pass to. We'll give it a pass because we can't win the case anyway because the only customer is saying uh, the, we're, we're, we're happy with it and we'll say, okay, we, we try to be very transparent about that. Um, um, you mentioned the Qualcomm case. This is in many ways, and thank goodness, a, a real outlier. But for, but, but for those who are, who are not aware, the, 
the, the FTC uh, at, at the end of the Obama administration by a 2-1 vote brought a, a lawsuit challenging certain licensing practices by, by Qualcomm. Uh, and among the arguments they made was that the, uh, the suit shouldn't succeed because if it does, uh, the only company that will, people that will benefit are, are Chinese competitors. Uh, and that'll be to the detriment of the national security interests of, of the United States. Um, and a totally unprecedented and bizarre development. The other US agency that enforces the antitrust laws, the Department of Justice, uh, agreed with Qualcomm. They went into court and argued against the FTC position. They, they brought in uh, affidavits and statements from people who work in the national security area in, in the US government to, uh, to, to make these arguments. I'll just say personally, to me, it was quite unusual because we spend a lot of the time talking to uh, our foreign counterparts and, and others, as I mentioned, about keeping other policy goals outside of the realm of, of, of antitrust. Uh, and here was the DOJ saying you, 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 to the court, uh, anyway, you ought to, you ought to consider this, uh, th th this argument. So unprecedented, I don't, I don't know if, if it has any lasting uh, effect. We, uh, we wound up, we won the case in district court uh, and the Ninth Circuit reversed and dismissed our case. Uh, we've appealed to the, we've, we've sought appeal in the, in the certiorari in the Supreme Court. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what, what comes of that. One of the interesting things though is because you're an independent agency, you could actually take positions that are different from the Justice Department. And one of the other wrinkles is, even though you're an independent agency, you still need to get Solicitor General approval before uh, taking a case to the Supreme Court. And so there's a weird, interesting tension. Well, I don't know, or do you? Maybe I'm wrong. They, they have first dibs, and if they decline, we can take it ourselves. Okay. And we've done that in the past. Uh, and um, we, we, we've been successful. I mean, two, two examples. Uh, when I was first at the FTC, uh, DOJ didn't want to go to the Supreme Court on the, uh, I think it was the Indiana Federation of, of Dentists case on uh, pro professional association restraints. We took it up ourselves in 190. Um, the Justice Department also didn't support us in challenging so-called pay for delay pharmaceutical settlements and the sharing plow, which became, it became the activist case and we won that in the Supreme Court as well. Uh, so um, we'll see what happens this time. Well, uh, we're almost at the end. Um, any other questions before we close? Sarah, you get the last one. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. I would just be curious um, what you would recommend for a law student or a young lawyer who might be interested in joining your staff or a similar um, role within the government one day? All right, well, I'll take those two separately, uh, Sarah. So my staff is a little un unusual because, uh, well, we, we don't hire it right out of school. Um, it's better for people who work in the international area to already be pretty well grounded in, in the practice of law in general and, and in the field, whether it's antitrust or privacy or, or consumer protection. I, I tell people in the antitrust area who want to do international antitrust is they first become a good US antitrust lawyer. You have to know our system. You can't talk intelligently or persuasively to others unless you know your own um, system. Um, uh, and then, you know, be, be uh, um, you know, take advantage of, of opportunities along the way to broaden your horizons in internationally, to pay attention to what's going on uh, abroad, if you can get exposure to different, it's not a, a, at all a requirement to, to know another language, but, but to be able to deal with, with different cultures uh, is, is, is very helpful. Um, I mean, really for my, for my, for my office, um, 
people skills are as, as important as legal skills. Um, we, we have to, uh, uh, we, we, we don't have any mechanisms to make people in other countries do what we want them to, to do uh, if they don't want to. Uh, so it's, it's, it's building relationships, it's, it's being uh, per per persuasive, uh, it's being open-minded. Um, so, and, and I would say just take advantage of opportunities to broaden your um, experience generally. So if somebody's an antitrust lawyer and they're, and they're in a firm, if they have an opportunity to, to, to learn how the corporate side works. That's, that's very valuable or how, intellect, or intellectual property, you know, it, not everything, but, but the more adjacent things you can be exposed to, they will help you uh, when you come back to your, to your core, core area. Um, and uh, look, I'll put in a plug for public service at some point in, in one's career. Um, I, I think it really broadens uh, people as a, as a lawyer, makes life more interesting. The public sector experience is, uh, is valued by um, people in the private sector, by law firms, by clients, sometimes too much by clients. I think, oh, when I, when I left the FTC, oh, then you must be the expert on, or you can, you can get this done for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Let them think that, okay. But, but, but the fact is, I believe that people are, are better private sector lawyers if they've been uh, they spend some time in the public sector. And by the way, the reverse is true as, as well. I mean, we have people who spend their career in government and that's, they're, that's great. They're, they're wonderful um, uh, institutional memory and, and, and resources and we welcome that. But it, it's also extremely valuable, in fact, essential that we have people who have been in, in the private sector and the so-called real world and work with businesses and firms and bring that knowledge uh, in as well. Among other things, it avoids a um, black hat, white hat, we them men mentality, which is wrong. And I'll tell you something, it's, it's, it's a rare benefit of the US uh, system compared to almost every other system in the world where people have to choose either early in their career, whether they're public sector or private sector and rarely the two shall cross. So if you have the opportunity, um, either at, right after law school or being in the private sector for a while, coming into government for a few years and going back, uh, I, I'd highly recommend that. Well, if I may, Randy, I think you did it right, which is I think doing it sooner rather than later, right out. Um, I really learned from my best friend at Hogan when I was practicing. Um, he uh, didn't, he looked at a big firm job and didn't get it because he came from, he was a Case Western student. He uh, landed with the EPA and after three or four years, he came out having done real enforcement and had real skills when all of his colleagues had done document review and memos. Mm -hmm. And so I think he found that actually the irony is not getting the thing he thought he wanted accelerated his career. Mm -hmm. And that's a, an insight that I think government gives you that kind of responsibility very, very quickly. The other thing I'll say, Sarah, is um, unlike when Randy was saying when he came out of school, uh, antitrust opportunities were thin, and I would say there have been many eras since that's the case. That's not your problem right now, and probably getting international exposure in this space has never been easier. And so if that's the direction you want to go, this is a great time. It's a guarantee of this. You can see certain sectors. It's a guarantee of full employment for a graduating lawyer. Right now. So. I have put my email address and my uh, FTC cell number in the chat. And, and, and Christopher and, and Carolyn, if that's not the best way to uh, make sure people have it, feel, please feel free to disseminate it. And I invite and I encourage you, uh, any of you to contact me any anytime with any other questions you have or follow up, or if you're pursuing it up, if you're applying to the FTC, let me know. Uh, I'd, I'd love to, I wish I could hire you all right now. Uh, I, I love having pen people and you are all terrific. You've asked really uh, perceptive uh, questions and uh, I, I'd be happy to be of any help I, I can as, as you pursue what I'm sure will be very uh, rewarding careers. Well, thank you. I, um, I guess I'm the, got the mouthpiece. So on behalf of all of the entire pain community, thank you very much for spending this time with us. And uh, we, it's a, you've given us a lot to think about and a really inspiring uh, point of view on how things don't always work out the way you plan in all the right ways. So thank you. That's true. Amen. 
And we hope to see you if you're interested in more on December 2nd, uh, um, an antitrust December 2nd event, which we'll do. And uh, keep your eyes open for future events. And we'll look forward to seeing you there. Uh -huh.